start, um, let me uh, take you back in time a little bit um, to late uh, spring um, in summer uh, of uh, 2020. This is really the midst or the beginning of our newly found um, fears, anxieties, um, and overall the uncertainties of, of COVID crises. We came um, to witness um, a brutal killing, a brutal killing of uh, George Floyd, um, which was uh, fully recorded on tape, and in that sense, quite shocking. Um, then, in, in its aftermath, uh, we witnessed a subsequent uprising that swept across America, the first place, and then the world um, uh, as well, including, or perhaps more accurately, especially um, Britain, which has its own uh, slave past, of course, uh, just enmeshed uh, with, um, within its imperial and, and colonial history. So that global um, uprising, uh, if you will, also started a public debate um, here in Britain, as elsewhere, uh, but, the, but the, the one in Britain is especially interesting for reasons that I will, I will talk about. Um, but the, the public debate revolved around um, global legacies of slavery, the kind of social, economic, um, and legal order that it, it brought about, it spawned, um, which was based uh, primarily on a racial uh, difference. So that really was the essence of that public debate that followed um, the, or actually um, was quite uh, simultaneously carried out um, with, with the protests. So um, this is of course not to say that uh, such discussions did not exist before, um, but this was really the first time that uh, it, the, the, the issue was discussed uh, with this level of intensity and uh, this scale um, as well. Um, and this is also uh, not to say that such events um, as uh, the police killing of George Floyd um, uh, did not happen before. Um, it, uh, it certainly did. Um, uh, that um, if anything, um, such events as, I mean, especially lynchings uh, were public spectacles um, in the late 19th century, the early 20th century US. Um, well, they barely attracted attention uh, from general public, but nevertheless, they were you know, public events, um, um, let alone inciting um, widespread uh, uh, protests. And here um, I included this uh, image, especially um, because, because it's such a strong image. Um, notice um, what's written on the scaffold that says justice. And this is one expression um, of justice. And that's really um, what makes it very, very complicated because everyone has um, their own understanding of justice. Whereas you can see, um, that here um, uh, that is a lynching going on. Um, lynchings as public spectacles uh, continued uh, through um, the early uh, 20th century in the US, um, which eventually forced African-American uh, populations, the uh, Southern states to migrate rather flee, uh, flee uh, to the cities, bigger towns up North where they, um, they um, met this time um, their pogroms and race riots and massacres uh, too. So um, it really continues in, in different um, um, uh, forms uh, in the uh, later parts of the 19th, uh, 20th century. So this has been an ongoing situation in the US um, with great intensity, but also it produced a lot of highly strategic, highly creative ways of protesting and standing against that violence, which really we in the rest of the world owe a lot to. So it's important to see these um, two sides of the story together. I mean, that these are horrific events, um, such as lynchings, which also created um, um, why the solar the solidarities, um, claims uh, to, to justice, equality, uh, and freedom, and so forth. Um, so it's important that we look into that um, uh, aspect um, as well. Um, but let me come back to uh, this side of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, 
the, the story um, uh, on this side of the Atlantic Ocean is not as visceral um, as in the US, at least ostensibly, uh, but nevertheless, legacies of slavery um, endured in, in various um, different forms. And to go back uh, to um, summer um, uh, 2020, um, one incident during uh, the widespread protests especially sparked or shifted um, or shaped the public debate that I talked about and uh, made it into a really heated one uh, in every way. Um, and I, by that, and you can see this on the screen, um, I mean specifically the toppling of the Colston statue in uh, Bristol. Um, so let me take you to that particular um, uh, moment, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, um, and raise a few basic questions. And please feel free to um, type uh, in um, in the um, uh, let me uh, in the chat section um, as as we as we go. Um, what was it that the protesters want? Um, what was the claim on the protesters' side? And um, what was the symbolic meaning? I mean, the, 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 the protesters made a, you know, a specific, um, uh, um, uh, specifically uh, uh, underlined it or made an, a specific emphasis of uh, toppling the um, statue into the um, Bristol, Bristol Harbor. So what was the symbolic uh, meaning um, of that? And these all tie, uh, of course, uh, to the question who Edward Colston um, was um, in, um, in many ways. Um, so, I mean, Edward Colston was a um, was, um, member of Royal African Society uh, Company um, from eight, 1680 onwards becoming one of its high ranking administrators, deputy governor in um, 1689. Um, Royal um, African Company held a monopoly um, on slave trade. Um, Colston himself personally was personally responsible for the transportation of 80,000 individuals from west coast of Africa to the Americas. Um, so I'm sure he oversaw a trade that brought great wealth um, to him uh, personally, uh, making Colston um, one of the richest uh, people in not in only in Bristol, but also um, in, um, in, in, in Britain, and um, also brought uh, with prosperity to, uh, to uh, Bristol uh, accordingly. And what that, I mean, you're talking about that scale um, in, in um, um, slave trade, is difficult to fathom. And um, let me just uh, show you an image. Um, well, here, this is something that I really love um, that came about as a joke um, right after the toppling of the, uh, of the statue. Um, that, uh, and you can see that happening all over the place in the world um, with, with other, um, other, other statue. Um, toppling incidents, um, which I found really uh, amusing. Um, and let me just uh, quickly uh, move on, um, just really to understand what it meant in actuality. Um, it really helps to look at what a slave ship looked like and how it was uh, how it was organized. You can see here um, that. Um, um, a ship that was regulated um, under um, the, the uh, 1788 act, uh, act, which limited the number of um, slaves that could be carried in one ship. Um, the the um, name of the ship um, is here. You can see a uh, Brooks, um, uh, and um, and um, was allowed to carry. Um, um, up to uh, 454 individuals. I mean, these are relatively small ships. Uh, you have to um, uh, uh, understand that you know the the the, the um, organization and the the the, uh, the the people on the um, on the ship um, had to be in this particular way. Um, but in the past, before the regulation, uh, this particular ship 
um, uh, reportedly took on as many as 609 people um, on board, uh, carried over. Um, uh, these these uh, people um, were shackled together, hundreds of enslaved people lay uh, in, in their own filth, basically, um, in a, uh, a, a, a voyage that lasted um, four to eight weeks, six to eight weeks. Um, and, and occasionally um, thrown into the water um, as well. Um, and um, um, there were other incidents um, right around that time. As we're talking about 17th century. This is really the height um, of, um, of slave trade across the Atlantic or the early beginnings of that, uh, that intense um, uh, trade. Um, the, um, when, one incident is especially um, uh, worthy of mention um, that, um, that uh, I mean, that, um, I, I said that the other, there, there were several incidents um, that uh, uh, that attested to um, extreme violence um, on, on, on these ships. And one is, as I said, uh, especially worthy of mention, uh, it's known as the Zong incident massacre, uh, where uh, more than 130 enslaved people were thrown overboard um, just to be claimed as insurance compensation by the ship's owners. Uh, and um, uh, this, um, I think, um, is an image um, that uh, illustration um, the description given by um, William Wilberforce, uh, the, the pioneering abolitionist in the UK, um, um, on a, in a speech delivered at the House of um, Commons. Um, one other question perhaps to, to, to raise, keep in mind, why did this happen in Bristol, uh, the, the uprising uh, specifically? Where else um, could this happen in, uh, in Britain? Um, we know that uh, Liverpool was also equally involved um, in, uh, in slave trade. Um, Gregson, uh, responsible for the Zong massacre that I just mentioned, was based in uh, Liverpool. Manchester um, was where um, the, um, sorry, um, where the cotton exchange market was based. Um, also it was party to, um, uh, to, to the slave trade in general. Glasgow uh, was also um, was, was part of that story. Quite a few people were engaged in slave produced um, uh, industrial agriculture and um, they amassed um, uh, tobacco and sugar profits in an unprecedented way uh, during this time. And of course, not to mention uh, finance and insurance sectors uh, based in London was also part of the making and sustaining of the Atlantic um, slave trade uh, system in many ways. Um, so um, uh, this uh, again um, ties into the question of the symbolic meaning um, of uh, the toppling the um, of, of Ed Colston statue, and also toppling uh, or throwing um, the statue into the uh, Bristol um, Harbor. Um, uh, but this is again a broader question uh, to think about uh, perhaps, did the statue itself um, um, uh, signify or commemorate um, whose memory and legacy uh, was it keeping um, alive uh, or commemorating uh, for whom? Uh, this was a uh, part of that uh, public debate, uh, this heated debate um, uh, during this time uh, that, uh, that I just mentioned. And um, one other question perhaps to keep in mind, the food for thought um, is uh, when um, the Colston statue was erected in the first place, um, which doesn't really go the, that uh, far back in time. Uh, the statue was, 18, uh, was erected in 1895. And one question to keep in mind and, 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 and uh, to, to, to raise here, why was that so? What was it um, that made 1895 uh, particularly an opportune time to, to, uh, to erect that statue um, the first year? And this really, uh, question applies to all statues of 
um, of um, uh, sort of dubious figures such as Edward Colston. Um, this uh, applies to all the Confederate statues in the US as well. They are erected at particular moments in American history as um, uh, uh, Edward Colston was, um, was, um, was um, um, that the statue was erected in that particular moment in uh, British history as well. Um, but um, let me, I mean, from, from, um, uh, from the act itself, let me move on to the responses um, to uh, the toppling of the Colston uh, statue. Um, as you may remember uh, from, um, um, from, from newspapers or, uh, or, um, or uh, TV news, um, that there were two, I mean, first of all, the, um, uh, the, the prime minister um, described and dismissed the act broadly as thuggery um, and not much else. Um, that's um, how it was presented um, by, uh, by, by, by the state, uh, by the government. Uh, but other than that, there were uh, two main um, line of arguments, which I found very interesting, which also ties to what we're dealing with um, here, but also in the module um, in general. Um, first of these um, lines of argument um, was so sort of historically inaccurate claim um, that uh, said basically British Empire was involved in slave trade, true, but it was also the first country um, in the world that banned slavery. Um, so it deserves a credit for being the world's uh, first abolitionist um, state. I, I say this is um, historically inaccurate um, because um, the, the first uh, country that banned slavery was Saint-Domingue, um, known as Haiti today. Um, through an in island-wide uh, slave rebellion. So the, the actual practice of slavery was banned as a result of a slave revolt um, on the island. Um, this happened shortly after the French Revolution, um, where the slaves went against royalist uh, slave owners and um, rightly asked, are, are we now Republican citizens? Um, so they, of course, knew the uh, answer uh, to uh, this question, um, that well, they were not uh, from the viewpoint of the, of, of, the, um, of, of the French, but nevertheless, they asked the question and made the claim to citizenship, Republican um, citizenship. And in doing so, um, they managed to obtain not only their personal freedom, um, after a very long and arduous um, process, of course, but um, they also effectively free decolonized, um, eventually at least, um, from French um, government, um, ended up paying um, a huge debt for this, um, but nevertheless, um, they claimed uh, their freedom as, as an island of, of slaves, um, in, um, if, if you will. Um, and just as a side note, um, why don't we know about this uh, history? Um, uh, for that, you can take a quick look at um, um, uh, Michel Rothe-Trouillot's uh, famous and, and influential path-breaking book, Silencing the, um, the Past. It talks about uh, the uh, relationship of power and, um, and um, the, the process of writing history, recording um, history. Um, so Brit British Empire was not um, uh, the first to ban slavery. The confusion comes uh, from uh, perhaps the technicality that British uh, Empire was, was very much involved in um, banning the slave trade uh, in the world. And here uh, you can see at the moment, um, or maybe um, uh, this document as well, um, that this uh, was made uh, so. Um, so in that sense, um, uh, Britain certainly deserves a credit um, for uh, abolishing slave trade um, in the world, especially in the, on the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but um, nevertheless, um, it also uh, used that um, legal development that it affected 
um, to its benefit um, in, um, in, in other parts of the world. Um, here uh, you can see um, a, a telegram uh, a message from the British consul in the, from the, the uh, coastal town of Izmir in today's Turkey, um, where um, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the consular offices, as well as um, uh, British um, 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 uh, marine forces um, were, um, naval forces uh, were policing uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. And here um, you can see British uh, Consul Cumberbatch writing uh, to the uh, ambassador about possible uh, trafficking of slaves in the, uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And Cumberbatch uh, here um, you can see is, um, is the great um, uh, grand uncle of Benedict Cumberbatch as, as you may have um, uh, suspected. Um, the second line of argument um, uh, to, to, um, to continue, um, in response uh, to the uh, protests and the toppling of the, um, of the statue of Colston, um, was, I mean, at least for me, was immensely more interesting uh, than the first one, uh, which I dedicate the remainder of, of this lecture. So many people, um, Britain's practice of slavery was insignificant, or involvement in slavery was insignificant, by and of itself uh, for the simple fact that every civilization in history also practiced it. Conservative MPs, uh, public intellectuals, some uh, traditional controversial historians described slavery simply as banal, banal because, uh, because everyone uh, practiced it at, at uh, some point. So for them, um, slavery as uh, practiced directly in the British Caribbean, for instance, or profited from indirectly uh, by the British Empire was merely one among many um, uh, forms of slavery, practice of slavery in the past millennia of human history. And for that reason, uh, constituted no basis um, for the kind of critique directed at Britain's uh, imperial past uh, in general, individuals um, like Edward Colston uh, in particular. So here again, um, let me unpack um, uh, this um, argument a bit, um, uh, this line of argument, uh, because it's very important, especially um, for understanding the broader uh, global history legacies of um, slavery. Um, those who make this uh, particular claim on the so-called banality of slavery um, tend to um, underplay, uh, not necessarily deliberately, but downplay uh, the uh, meaning and uses of slavery and slave labor um, um, as it changed in the 19th um, century. Um, in the 19th century, uh, no aspect um, of the kind of slavery practiced um, in a large sites or, or uh, farms of industrial agriculture known as plantations resembled any uh, other system of slavery in the world or in the history. I mean, you have to realize the scale and intensity um, of, of plantation slavery uh, in place um, in the 19th century. Um, one of the most immediate reasons, uh, especially in the um, uh, towards the uh, uh, towards mid nineteenth century, um, that, um, had to do mainly with new technologies employed in um, cotton production, as a cotton gin um, invented in late eighteenth uh, century, fully adopted uh, and employed in early uh, decades of the um, of the nineteenth um, century. Um, or a new uh, plan, uh, transportation uh, technologies, most notably uh, the steamboat, who could now go up the river, um, of Mississippi specifically, um, carrying the slave produced cotton to the cotton mills of the northern uh, states, um, which, I mean, the, the, the northern states banned slavery a long time ago, but nevertheless benefited uh, from the commercial boom. Uh, attached to um, uh, slave-produced cotton. 
So um, what I mean, this is what uh, historians uh, called steamboat imperialism, um, which gradually connected the cotton producing um, South, uh, uh, American South, to the industrial North and to the world gradually um, as well. All these developments gave um, slavery a novel and unprecedented uh, economic significance, um, cut, uh, seriously catapulting America to the helm of well, world economy, while bringing great wealth um, and power to its trade allies, most uh, notably British Empire. So even after um, uh, Britain abolished slavery in its entirety, and this happens um, in um, 1838, um, it continued to ally with uh, American cotton producers and continued uh, to really benefit from the, uh, from the, from the slave produced cotton uh, for, for good part of the 19th century. And what is really key here um, is that the US-UK uh, coalition steered world politics um, to protect slavery whenever possible or to export the plantation model um, to other places whenever necessary. And I'll say a few things about this uh, in a minute. And moreover, the uh, coalition um, also brought about a kind degree of brutality and accompanying legal arrangements uh, that justified and regulated that uh, brutality, unlike any other places in time and in, in history, in terms of scale, um, especially. Um, so this, this particular context of a global um, economy, um, uh, a global uh, economy that really brought or entwined Mississippi, Manhattan, and Manchester all together, um, uh, that the um, white supremacist system of differential rights and entitlements uh, which are really still um, in effect uh, to this day, um, set it apart uh, from other systems of slavery elsewhere in the world or earlier um, in, um, in, in, in history. So here you can see um, an excerpt from, uh, from Chicago Defender, the most influential African-American newspapers in the US, um, uh, reporting on St. Louis race riots uh, in 1917. Um, this uh, sort of differential rights and entitlements um, uh, that's really nicely uh, described here, you can see on the, uh, on the screen, um, that um, uh, still continue uh, to exist in, in uh, especially in America, um, and um, it's just basically according to, uh, to which even murder can be um, overlooked. And that was really the implication um, um, of the protests um, that, that took place in um, spring and summer uh, 2020. Um, so um, also historians of slavery found striking parallels uh, between oppressive practices of enslaved labor regimes and today's labor regimes. A number of financial tools such as insurance, especially life and health insurance, um, originating from slavery, management of slavery, uh, credit structures and systems that were designed to keep the freight free slaves in check, um, still affect us um, in um, the form of uh, punishing bank practices and regulations. That's uh, important, uh, again, to, to, um, to keep in mind and raises a question. Um, so this is one important element to, to um, um, we'll keep in mind is that legacies of slavery um, are multifaceted and um, that emerges, it happens in every um, segment, every um, uh, practice that we um, uh, live uh, today, that we have uh, today. Um, the other important um, element um, um, is, uh, maybe this is something that I will um, wrap up with um, uh, shortly, um, that this was really, uh, these developments uh, were really not, even though took place or practiced mostly in the Atlantic world, uh, they were not confined to the Atlantic world um, at all. 
Um, it was uh, transported and transplanted in other parts of the world, um, um, put to use um, in other parts of the world, um, uh, uh, in, in other places um, effectively. And one uh, famous incident, uh, perhaps, um, uh, episode uh, uh, that is um, still not well studied, but uh, nevertheless uh, quite famous, the case of Egypt um, during the American Civil War, uh, which lasted from 1861 to 65, uh, British traders in cotton effectively managed to build a plantation system in Egypt which produced not only immense amount of uh, cotton, but almost um, all of them were uh, slave produced. So we see um, that the plantation system exporting itself to a completely new environment and, um, uh, and employing um, uh, slaves to produce that cotton as well. That the exact model is, is um, as, uh, transferred uh, to, to another context. Um, so um, this move, um, as you may uh, guess, um, also produced numerous indigenous um, Edward Colstons, uh, among uh, numerous other slave traders. Uh, most famous um, one you can see on the screen is uh, Zubair Pasha in, in Sudan. Uh, so he sets up his uh, trading business right when things were happening, uh, building up, um, that the plantation system was, was carried over and, and set up in Egypt. And um, he uh, is um, a, a local um, a version of, um, of Edward Colston, uh, responsible for, um, um, for, uh, for slave raids, um, capturing slaves, selling them into, um, into, um, uh, into slavery. Um, so he amassed um, um, wealth and prestige that really matched um, with the, that of Edward Colston, um, served as a governor, um, uh, paradoxically directly appointed by the British colonial government in the region. Um, just, I couldn't really um, locate a statue of him uh, in, in Sudan, but nevertheless, um, there is a street in Khartoum uh, named after him. So he is comm commemorated in a similar way that um, Colston is in, um, in Bristol. So in that sense, um, this particular form of slavery, uh, which is intimately linked to colonialism and imperialism, produce similar patterns um, of oppression, violence, exploitation, race-based value extraction, similar patterns of capital accumulation, so on and so forth in other parts of the world. And this is what I would like to, uh, to, um, to end uh, this lecture with. Um, so um, just to remember um, that um, looking into these processes in connection with each other, allows us to see with greater clarity that the exploitative and coercive structures that were created by slavery, just as I said, the plantation model and its business practices could be, and in fact, were transported and reproduced in other parts of the world. And in that sense, the presumed confines of the Atlantic or any other world uh, were not always neatly drawn and practices of domination and exploitation did travel around the world, but so did the ideas of uh, freedom and justice to, to form um, alliances and solidarities. So that's really well, just, you know, one uh, question uh, perhaps uh, to, um, to, to think along with these uh, themes. Um, as well as with many other modules offered uh, by my colleagues at the department across the school, um, what did and does uh, connected forms of domination exploitation look like? Um, uh, how um, the connection uh, connected forms of claims for justice and equality look like? I mean, these are really um, just real broad questions that is of uh, great concern um, here. Um, how do we approach uh, to such complex multifaceted questions and problems is a methodological question, um, uh, historically speaking. 
And also um, another perhaps uh, methodological, or even um, uh, ontological question, what does studying history of slavery teach us about the world uh, we live in today? Slavery, legally speaking, does not exist, but its traces, um, its ghost um, very much exists, um, continues to exist um, um, to this um, day. And with that, I mean, I guess um, I can just um, end uh, here um, and um, we can uh, perhaps um, uh, continue with Q&A. Uh, maybe um, Lars want to uh, come in and, uh, and, and first introduce himself and then um, if, if you want to uh, comment or, or raise any questions or talk about your own um, um, approaches to um, some of these wider questions um, as well. Yes. Uh, yes, if I can take the word um, briefly. Uh, well, thank you very much for it. It was a fascinating uh, session and uh, everyone who's taken part. Um, this is um, the big conundrum. We teach so many interesting things and yet we don't have the opportunity to sit in on our uh, colleagues' uh, courses because um, there, there is so much, uh, such a rich uh, 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 resource of knowledge that we, uh, th that we possess. And um, uh, I envy you students who can actually go and uh, study all of this because we have our own specializations, uh, of course, which we um, stay um, faithful to. Um, just, um, I mean, the, the it was the last um, uh, comments that you had, which I found were most important, that uh, it, slavery is a flexible term. Um, its um, use in the West is very closely linked to, um, to slavery and antiquity in uh, Mediterranean anti antiquity, as it was, for example, uh, practiced by the Romans. But um, this coincided in the age of slavery with a, a um, um, well, a renaissance, if you like, of the second renaissance of uh, antiquity when, when people thought it was completely normal because the, the great civilizations of the past had been built on slavery systems. So why not the British or the French empire? So this is, uh, this is something which um, is, is very typical of the West uh, during this time. Um, Opposed to that, you have uh, East Asian uh, civilizations where slavery means something very, very different. Um, and um, it, for example, in the Qing Empire, it was a form of punishment, which was um, uniquely administered to uh, to the Han Chinese, so majority uh, Chinese populations, who were sent to Central Asian. Uh, um, nations, tribes, who um, uh, who practiced slavery, and their slavery was only practiced against uh, defeated enemies in battle. So it, it was not, had no economic role at all. Um, and um, uh, this is something where, you know, you have the same phenomenon, but in a different setting. Um, yes, so I, that, that's no more I don't want to say now. <laughs> Thank you, um, Lars. Do you Want to introduce yourself as well? And the, the oh, yes, I, I'm, I, my name is Lars Lahman. I I teach um, the history of Eastern and uh, Central Asia, and uh, we, my own research is more uh, focused on the uh, 17th and 18th centuries. But uh, of course, through teaching and uh, related research, I I <laughs> go all the way until today. Um, but but. Um, uh, the, the important thing is that we all try to work together. So uh, we have, for example, the uh, the history seminar. Um, we have also the have the Chinese history seminar, where where I always try to in, invite people who have uh, a, a, who do something that goes across Asia at least, so to the other side of the Eurasian continent. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I mean, we have. Um about 10 more minutes um, if you want to raise uh, questions um, related to uh, the lecture or other anything else that you might be curious about. Um, okay, we have a hello. Um, I might have missed this uh, part. I got disconnected in the middle. I wanted to ask if you could please give uh, some examples of how plantation model was transported um, to the um, to other areas. Um, so we, I mean, uh, um, I mentioned uh, Egypt, Egyptian case, 
And that's the most famous one uh, in the context of uh, the Middle East, uh, which I specialize on. Um, the, the, um, the, the, the transportation uh, or transplantation um, is directly related to the, uh, to the American Civil War. Um, when the Union blockade uh, takes place at the very beginning of the war, um, the, uh, the Britain has no longer access uh, to, to uh, uh, South-produced cotton. So um, they, I mean, uh, this is uh, still early uh, for Egypt to be, um, uh, to be British um, a colony. I mean, it happens later in 1880s, um, but nevertheless, um, Britain has um, a good amount of control in the region and um, effectively manages uh, to, um, to move that model um, over to, to Egypt, which was already experimenting with new cotton um, uh, 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 types and brands, uh, 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 kinds. Um, so um, it, it becomes um, a, a viable model for, for, for the Egyptian um, state um, as well. And we see, I mean, again, um, slavery existed in the region, in Egypt um, already, um, but the, the, the very use of it, the very meaning of it and its economic implication, ch implications changes um, completely uh, with that uh, move. So this is one example. We know other examples from Southeast Asia, um, Indian Ocean, um, that, that um, I mean, ha of course, that region has its own um, uh, past uh, and, and um, experience with different types of uh, plantation-like um, environments, but we see uh, that uh, transportation happens um, pretty easily when, um, when it's seen as necessary. Um, so that's really um, uh, the, the um, and not only the the, the, um, the plantation, but also um, the, the the as I said, I mean in, in the lecture, the business model uh, that I mean it's a, there's a, a very particular way of managing a plantation. Um, it's it's focus on 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 the household. It's also implementing um, adopting all these scientific management methods. Um, accounting, so on and so forth. So, I mean, there's um, really a business side of this, and this also gets um, easily transported and implemented in other place with some modification, but, uh, but nevertheless, it happens. Um, any, any other questions? Um, okay, okay, great. Um, as as Lars said, I mean, um, different parts of the world had um, had uh, practices, different uh, types of practices um, in uh, uh, very much um, happening at the same time. Um, I work on, as I said, um, uh, slavery in the Middle East, and um, this is. I mean, slavery um, exists and pract very much practiced during this time of the 19th century as well, um, without a clear, um, uh, 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 without a clear uh, economic benefit. Okay, thank you very much, Lars. Uh, thank you for your comments and uh, participation and dropping by. Bye. Um, so, um, uh, uh, Slavery is practiced pretty much everywhere in the world, uh, but the, the kind of um, scale and intensity and uh, the economic implications and the, the very fact that it's, um, it's purely and very rigidly race-based is, is very peculiar to the Atlantic system. Um, so in that sense, it really um, is different from other systems of slavery. I think if there's no more questions, we might unfortunately have to end there because we have um, one more session. So for anyone who's been sticking around for the whole day, there's one more hour and a whole range of talks to choose. And from. just just to um, to end with, let me uh, type in my um, email um, address here. Um, 
if you want to reach out uh, to, to, to ask questions about the program itself, about slavery, about global history in the 19th century, um, about methodological questions, um, just please do not hesitate to reach out anytime, okay? Thank you so much, Tina, and thank you so much to everybody for joining us. We had more students throughout um, who were here for the presentation, and so we'll be making sure to send the recording. But Great. take care, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the virtual PTD. Bye.